Our scripture this morning comes from 1 John 5, 1 through 6. Today is the last Sunday of the Easter season. And you know, I have spoken about love for the last seven Sundays. That's what Easter is. It's all about love. All about the love that God showed for us as His children. Our scripture this morning says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments, for the love of God is that, that we obey His commandments. And His commandments, they're not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that con conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only with water, but with water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. You know, I asked the question this morning, what is true love? What is it? It's a very difficult question. And many people have tried to answer it over the years, but no answer seems to really be adequate. Here are just a few of the, the quotes that we have. Eric Siegel writes, true love comes quietly without banners or flashing lights. But he also says, if you hear bells, get your ears checked. Mm -hmm. Ann Landers describes love as a friendship that has caught fire. Now that's a pretty good definition of love, I would think, but how do you know if that fire of passion is going to last? and that if that power of passion is actually real. Helen Keller once wrote, Love is like a beautiful flower, which I may not touch, but whose fragrance makes the garden a place of delight just the same. I like that answer probably a little better, but it's still not very helpful because it leaves me asking this question, is what does love smell like? These answers don't really help us to define true love. But perhaps God, I think, has a better answer. If you have your Bibles, join me in the verses that we just read where God's Word defines what true love really is. You know, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. If you love the Father, you have to love his children. By these words, we know that we love the children of God, that we love God, that we obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep those commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. If you truly love God's children, you have to have and you have to obey him. You have to keep those commandments. You have to do his will. True love is not sentimental silliness. True love is doing what is right and what is best for the person that you love as defined by God himself. In matters of love, don't follow your heart because in Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The heart will lead you astray every time, but God will never lead you astray. So don't follow your heart. Follow God's Word. Follow what God has revealed to us, what God has declared to us in His Word. Because he knows what he knows what's best. Our heart doesn't. 
it might feel right. It might feel right in your heart. But what feels right may not actually be right. It may actually bring more harm than it brings good. You know, there was a... Y'all know that I deal with children all the time. Back in 2006, I read an article that the... Um, um, agricultural people, not agriculture, architectural people published, and they had done a study. They had, they had built a playground, and they, in the middle of this playground, they put like a jungle gym. And the kids would, would go and play on that jungle gym, and they tended to just play right there. They didn't tend to, to migrate out from that nucleus of the playground. They came back then and put a fence around the perimeter of the playground. And surprisingly, the children then would not only play around the playground equipment, but they felt safe to be able to, to filter out a little more and to be able to be a little more exploring. And they concluded from that that when children are given limitations, they felt safer than just a playground. They <clears throat> felt safer to be able to explore with a boundary, in this case, that fence. The children felt more freedom. Well, my friends, the absence of those fences, I think this shows, causes fear causes apprehension with all of us. Those fences is boundaries. The absence of fear, the absence, the absence of boundaries creates fear, creates apprehension. Well, my friend, I'm here today to tell you that God's Word is our fence. Mm -hmm. God's Word is our boundary. And if we have the opportunity now having those boundaries. It gives us the freedom, lack of fear, to be able to explore a bigger place. We don't help people when we remove boundaries. We hurt them. I'll give you a couple examples. As a parent, when we remove the boundaries and we say, okay, I'll go and buy alcohol for your party, or we remove the boundaries that when a man sleeps with someone he is not married to, that is not love. That is not, neither one of those are love that we can ignore. We also cannot ignore the sins of our brother or sister's life and pretend that everything is okay. That is not love when we ignore, ignore the clear command of the scripture in our relationship with someone else. If anyone is caught in a transgression, you are spiritually held to restore them in the spirit of gentleness. Those words come from God's word, from Galatians 6, 1. Sometimes this process, though, of restoration is extremely painful. But if you truly love someone, then you will not let them continue in their brokenness and in their sin. Instead, you'll do whatever you need to do, whatever is necessary to help to restore the one who has been broken by sin. When you do what is right by God's standard and not what feels right, then you have absolutely demonstrated true love. There was a pastor in, in Grayson, Kentucky, he received a phone call from a man who needed some counseling. He invited the man to the church and they went into his study and the man told him his story that about 10 years before, in the fit of anger, he had killed his wife. He and his wife had a daughter. And when he went to prison, the daughter went to live with his in law he was now out of jail. It was in December, and he was feeling kind of tearful. 
because he had not seen his daughter for so long. He told pastor, the pastor that he said, I can even probably even pass from the street and not realize who she is. And now as Christmas neared, his heart ached to be able to have a reconciliation with her. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. But in the story that I read, Pastor Phil made a comment. He made a comment that when this man came into his office, he raised his hands up, the man did, and said, Pastor said, I want to make one thing clear. I don't I want to leave God out of this conversation, okay? As Pastor Phil listened to him, he thought to himself, well, the whole problem here is that we've left Jesus out of this. Mm -hmm. Don't leave Jesus out of your life. Don't leave him out of your relationships. Obey Christ. Obey Christ in everything because true love, true love does what is right, not just what feels right. If you truly love someone, obey God. However, if we're going to obey God, we have to do something else. We have to trust God. We have to rely on God. We have to depend on Him, believing that He knows what is best and that God has our best interest in His heart. <coughs> the Bible tells us, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. And that victory is our faith. Our faith. And who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Your faith in Christ makes you an overcomer. Your faith in Christ makes you a, con a conqueror. Your faith in Christ makes you a victorious champion in God's army. And you can't miss it in these verses because three times it talks about the one who overcomes the world. And this means that when you trust God, when you trust the Lord, and you obey the Lord, even when the whole world is pressuring you to do something different, when you believe God, you can go against every tide or every notion and you can do what God tells you to do. And when you rely on God, you can resist all those temptations of the world and all those ideals about love and you can love in the way that God wants you to love. There was a young Korean boy named Kim Duk Soo. There's a day in November, November the 20th, 1950, that he will never forget. This was the day that communist troops found him and his father hiding in a root cellar in North Korea. Kim now is the administrator of a Presbyterian hospital in Taegu, South Korea. But he has a lot of difficulty telling this story, telling his story, his own testimony. <clears throat> when he, he said when his family heard that the soldiers were coming, <coughs> that he thought he was surely going to be killed. His eyes filled with tears. He recanted the story. He said, my daddy told me that we couldn't tell a lie to save our own lives. The world would say otherwise. But Kim's father trusted God enough to do what God said, even if it meant certain death. Kim's father had been a pastor at a church there in Taegu, South Korea for 42 years. When they heard the communist troops were coming, he and his wife hid their family under some rice bags and some dirt. And after two days of hiding, Kim became discouraged. And he climbed out. His father climbed out with him to bring him back to safety. And when they got outside, here were the communist troops, so they went and hid in the root cell. The communist troops found them. And they took them to a makeshift prison, and they were to be executed the next morning. The 
soldiers, one of the captains of the army asked him, he said, son, are you a Christian? Kim thought about it, and he thought, man, said, if I tell him no, then I'm going to be lying. His father had told him, you don't lie just for the sake of <clears throat> your own self. So he told the captain, he said, I am a Christian. The captain looked at him and took him by the shoulder. He said, son, I'm a Christian. And he said, I was a Sunday school teacher before this terrible war broke out. And he said, you must escape tonight. I am going to help you. And Kim fled that night, having to leave his father in that makeshift prison, knowing that he was waiting his eventual death. Kim reached an American army base. And... He said while he was hanging around there, he discovered an organ in the chapel. And he said, I, I taught myself how to play that organ. He remembers an American captain by the name of Shoemaker. That was the only thing he could remember about this American captain. This American captain saw that Kim had a talent. And so he arranged for a new a new <coughs> instrument for, for Kim to play and some instructions. And for the next 10 years, Kim played that organ every Sunday for chapel services at that army base. After he left the army base, he played that organ for the next 30 years at the, the church where his father preached for 32 years. He said that I had over 2,000 young Koreans who sang with me as I played the organ. And he said, I should have been killed by those communists. But God sent that Christian guard to help me escape. Mm -hmm. And when I played the organ at church, he said, I know that I am doing it for God. Amen. Kim's faith is what helped him to overcome the influences of a godly world, of a godless world. And your father can do the same for you. If you trust the Lord, you don't give in to the world's ideals about life and love, but instead you live and love the way that God tells you to because you believe in him, because you believe what he says. There was another army private that was stationed at Fort Bragg, South Carolina. North Carolina, I'm sorry. And there had been a clerical error. He was brand new to the, to the infantry that he was being assigned to. He had not received jump instructions, but because of an error, clerical error, he was put into an airplane, and they were flying, and he was ordered to jump out. He said, he did. He was doing what every good soldier was supposed to do, and that was to obey commands. My friends, don't question it. We are champions in God's army. Don't question it. Just believe it and jump when God tells you to jump, even if the whole world thinks you're crazy as a loon. Just believe. Trust God enough to do what God tells us to do, especially when it comes to our relationships that we have with each other. Gordon Johnson, he told the story about he had planted, or she, she, named Gordon, planted a flower. It was a rare kind of flower. And she nurtured it, and she trimmed it, and she watered it, and she provided for it the very best she could. And it grew. It was beautiful. It was vigorous. It had the most beautiful green leaves, but it never had a bloom. And she, every day, she would go out knowing that the bloom, that the bloom was going to be there. 
And one day while she was out looking at the beautiful green foliage on her vine, her neighbor who lived across the wall said, come, come over here, over here. And as she went over on the other side of the wall where her neighbor lived were the most beautiful blooms she had ever seen. My friend, that vine had worked its way through that wall and had bloomed on the other side. Her neighbor told her, said, thank you for planting that vine. Those blooms are just absolutely gorgeous. In Hebrews 11, because that owner who nurtured that vine had never really seen the fruits of her labor. In Hebrews 11, it tells us this, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. By faith, you do what God says even if you may not see the results because one day you will. Just like that lady saw the results of her work in those beautiful blooms, blooms on the other side. One day God's going to invite you to the other side. And all the love that you have nurtured, all the love that you have planted by faith and nurtured by your obedience to God, He's going to reveal to you. That's what true love is all about. True love trusts God enough to obey Him in all of our relationships. Obey God because you trust God. Jesus demonstrated for that on the cross for us. In obedience to His heavenly Father, Jesus suffered the injustice of the cross dying in our place for our sins. Why did He do that? Because He trusted God. Second Peter tells us when He was reviled, He did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but continued entrusting Himself to Him who judges justly. His obedience, His obedience and his trust was richly rewarded when God raised him from the dead and set him in his place of authority by the kingdom in heaven, by the throne. In Hebrews 12, it invites us to look to Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In obedient trust, Jesus died on that cross for our sin. It was true love. Jesus didn't do it because of what he felt, that it felt right. Jesus did it because he was doing what his father had told him to do, what he was instructed to. And my friends, I'm sure that going to the cross was not easy for Jesus. The Bible even tells us that he sweat great, he sweat great drops of blood in anticipation of that. Jesus did not do what felt right. Instead, he trusted God enough to do what was right in obedience to his Father. As a result, all of us who put our trust in God, we experience God's love in a secure, eternal relationship with him, which profoundly changes us from the inside out. How about you? Have you experienced that love for yourself? If not, I invite you to trust Christ with your whole life. In His strength, you will be able to love others the way that Christ loved you. 
there was a young woman from Chicago who got married but found that she could not relate to her husband because as a child, her stepfather had molested her for <coughs> a number of years. That experience had made it difficult to have any kind of physical love for anyone. A molested child does not like to be touched. Even though what a child needs most as they're growing up is someone to love them and someone to touch them and to someone to hug them. But this young woman, she was transferring all the revulsion that and the hatred that she had for her stepfather toward her husband and two others because of the depth of her shame and her bitterness that she had. She came to her pastor one Sunday and she told him about the issues that, were, that she was having and he made her to Luke 6 in the Bible. He told her, he said, this is what the Bible says you should do to your enemies. And so she looked and she read verse 27, and that verse tells us to love them, to do good, to bless them, to pray for them. The pastor says, that's all you have to do about your stepfather. Until you release all of those, those feelings of bitterness and guilt, only then will you be able to free to feel free in your relationship with him and to be able to love others the way you need to. I can just imagine that every fiber of her must have revolted in that, thinking, thinking, why should I love this man? All that he did to me, all those awful things, why should I love him? As she thought about it, she prayed and she decided that she would trust God enough to obey Him in this matter. She baked her stepfather a birthday cake. Rather than speaking evil of him, as she had always done, she decided to try to speak well of him the best she could. As she began to realize and think about the situation, she began to realize that there were good things that she could say about him. Despite this horrible sin that he had committed against her, the fact was that in many ways he was a good father. He provided for them. She began to think about those ways. And as she did, she began to speak better of him rather than of evil about him. She decided that she would pray then for him three times a day that God would bless him. And that's what she did. Several weeks later, she went as she continued to obey God's word, as she continued to pray, and as she continued to forgive this man who had so severely wronged her she told her pastor that she had seen her stepfather leave the supermarket. And as he was walking across the parking lot with a bag of groceries, for the first time in all of her life, there were actually feelings of love toward him rather than revulsion. Then she made the crucial statement that was very important to the survival of her marriage. Now, I'm free to love my husband. True love set her free. And my friends, true love will set you free. Try it for yourself. Trust God enough to obey Him in all of our relationships, no matter how it feels, and let God set you free. Let Him set you free. Father, we come to You this morning thanking You for revealing these words about true love. And how that we can have that true love for all of God's children. That we can't do it just through our heart. We have to do it through our belief and our faith in you. In keeping your commandments, in living your will that is spelled out to us in your book, Father, 
We need your strength to be able to show that true love and to give forgiveness where we need to forgive. And if we have bitterness, to let that bitterness resolve so that we can love everyone. Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning again to learn about true Christian love and how that love can affect us. And we have to have the faith that you're going to reveal to us on the other side the results of that true love. Thank you, Father. Hear our prayer. And in your name this morning we pray. Amen. As our music we come to tell you this morning, Father, to help us, to give us the strength and the knowledge to continue to follow your word, to continue to follow your commandments so that we can show true love to all of those that we encounter. Father, give us the knowledge that everything that we say, people can see the hear the glory of God and that they can see the glory of God through the actions that we give to them. Father, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for your love. And in your name this morning we pray. God loves you. You have his favor. Have a safe, wonderful, glorious, and happy week. I love you.